Sound Sleuth Lab. Jack. Testing one, two. Jack. Today on Sound Sleuth Labs, we're going to build the internal electronics for a condenser microphone based on a dual operational amplifier, the OPA 1642 from Texas Instruments. I've named the circuit the OPA Alice circuit in reference to Scott Helmke's original Alice microphone. My first attempt at this used a single OPA-134, which is a really good one, but on the edge of power consumption. It worked, and I went from a breadboard prototype to an actual printed circuit board. It limited me to only driving one leg of the XLR connector. Then I found the OPA-1642. Let's look at what it brings over the OPA-134. Hmm, it actually has better noise specs, although both are quite stellar, fantastic distortion specs, rail-to-rail -rail voltage swing, which means the electronics will not be a limiting factor in the microphone, and best of all, a low quiescent current, meaning we can run the dual version on phantom power with no issues. Yes! So how's this thing work? Starting at the XLR connector, we have two 22 nanofarad capacitors soldered right at the XLR from pin 2 and 3 to ground. These provide RF and EMI interference protection. The two 47 ohm resistors provide isolation for the internal circuitry and stabilize the op amp outputs. Then we head up through a pair of 2.2K resistors that bring the DC phantom voltage to a 47 microfarad capacitor and a 0.1 microfarad capacitor wired across it. The 47 microfarad does the initial DC voltage filtering and the 0.1 microfarad provides yet some more high frequency noise filtering. Now to stabilize the voltage we have a 12 volt zener. You could use two lower voltage zeners such as two 5.1 volts. The printed circuit board lets you do that. Zener diodes produce noise and there's a lot of tribal knowledge in the audio community that above 5.1 volts or so the noise rises. With that said, I tested the theory with a 12 volt zener and two 5.1 volt zeners. I did not see or hear technically a difference. The big reason is the following 200 ohm resistor and second 47 microfarad capacitor which creates an RC filter. The final thing we need to do is supply a virtual ground for the op amp as they're designed for split supply rails. The two 47K resistors and the 47 microfarad capacitor provide that. Now that we have power sorted out, on to the real circuit and why we're here to begin with. The signal from the microphone capsule is developed across the 1 gig resistor and goes to pin 3 of the first op amp. This is the positive or not inverting input. We have the output connected to pin 2, which is the inverting input. This is a classic op amp, non-inverting buffer. And with the OPA 1642, a very high impedance one. We also take the output to two other places. First it drives pin 2 of the XLR connector via a DC coupling capacitor, which happens to be yet one more 47 microfarad capacitor. It also goes to a 2.2K resistor. This is the input resistor to the second op amp stage, a unity gain inverting stage using the other 2.2K resistor between pin 6 and 7 as the feedback resistor. Once again, a classic op amp circuit. From pin 7, the signal which is now inverted and has the same magnitude as the output of the first op amp gets sent to pin 3 of the XLR connector via our last 47 microfarad capacitor. Boom! One high impedance buffer to low impedance differential signal out of the XLR, all powered externally via phantom power. Now, my only challenge is how to solder a surface mount chip. It's not actually that hard. You ready? Let's build this thing. Place it on the pad so it's sitting where it needs to be soldered. Note the pin layout marking on the printed circuit board in the IC chip. There's a little white circle on the printed circuit board, and then there's either a dot or a line on the IC chip. Solder one of the pins to hold it, tacking it into place. Then carefully solder all the rest. I got a solder bridge a couple times and then had to pull it away with a soldering iron when I did. Here's another shot of me tacking that first lead. The capacitors are next. The bigger ones are electrolytic and thus polarized. The long lead is positive and the board is marked where to put the leads. I like to bend mine slightly to hold them into place. Solder all five of the 47 microfarad capacitors. 
Then install the 2.1 microfarad capacitors. These aren't polarized, so just solder them in. The next component we'll solder is the Zener diode. These are polarized and have a black line on them indicating the cathode side versus the anode. The board is marked but is a little hard to see. The triangle part of the diode points to the cathode marking. D1 and D2 are used if you want to use two 5.2 volt zeners in place of one 12 volt. I'm keeping it simple. Solder in the zener diode. On to the resistors. Note the printed circuit board markings for the resistors showing one hole that has a circle around it. We're going to bend one lead over and then use the hole marked with a circle for the body of the resistor to sit on it. At this point you've seen enough of me solder, so go ahead and install the rest of the resistors. Now, let's inspect our finished boards. Having a macro lens on the camera really makes my work look bad, and then I can't solder. No worries, we're going to clean this all up. Our next step is to wash the boards. The solder I'm using has water-based flux, which makes cleaning easy, but it makes it extremely important. Cleaning the circuit board is critical, especially around the op amp and the high impedance input connections. Any residue here will cause noise and wreak havoc in the microphone, especially in a high humidity environment. We're going to wash the boards with some dish soap and a small acid brush. You can use an old toothbrush as well. Don't worry about the water, we're going to fix that later. Give the boards a thorough scrubbing and then rinse with some distilled water if you have it. If not, you can do a quick rinse with isopropyl alcohol, and in this case the 70% kind, just in rubbing alcohol is fine. Meanwhile, turn your oven on to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. We're going to bake the boards for about 20 minutes or so. This won't damage them and is actually something that a lot of PCB manufacturers do. It's pretty foolproof. Once the oven reaches 200 degrees Fahrenheit, turn it off and then put the printed circuit boards in there for 20 to 30 minutes. Don't worry if you lose track of time because the oven's cooling down anyway. Here's what they look like post-baking. My soldering looks way better when the flux is cleaned off. Note that we have not installed the one gig resistor yet. We're going to do that right before our build. The reason I did this is that this circuit can be used for both a condenser microphone circuit and a piezo contact mic to phantom power circuit. The only difference is substituting a one meg resistor for the one gig resistor. Happy soldering and then coming up next, we're going to build a microphone with this thing. The first step is to unscrew the base piece. This will then separate the body cylinder, exposing the frame and the internal PC board. These microphones are a case study in product and supply chain quality control and not in a good way. However, from the metal standpoint, I've never had an issue. The circuit board comes off with two screws. Every screw used is a metric M2.5 and my advice is to go buy a bag of these on Amazon to assemble your builds with. Okay, clip all the wires before or after taking out the screws, and after the board is removed, it's time to take off the head basket. This is also held on with two M2.5 screws. Then these should be pan head and not flat head. Although, over the years of doing this, I've seen a couple pan head screws used, but it was really randomly. Alright, let's look at the capsule. Wow, this one is actually a smaller internal FET based capsule stuffed into a bigger capsule body. Two more screws and this is gone as well. Now let's take out the XLR connector. We're going to solder some capacitors to this and new wires prior to reinstallation. This has a screw that screws in to move it in and remove the XLR connector. Now onto the BM700 body. This is almost the exact same thing except it has a tapered head basket versus a round head basket. Hmm, check out the capsule in this one. It is actually a real fetless one, and I've noticed that the circuit boards allow for either. The circuit is not too different from the FET based Shopes and the Alice, except there's not enough filtering on the Zener voltage regulator, and every batch that I get seems to have a different FET or output transistors, and it, they're really kind of random. One final thing to note is the tab on the body frame. This is our reference point for which direction the mic capsule is pointing. Okay, now that we have the donor bodies disassembled, there are a few final things we need to do before we can build the microphones. First, the XLR connector. We need to solder two 22 nanofarad capacitors to the XLR connector between pins 2 and 3 to ground. 
The reason the capacitors are here and not on the PC board is we need them to be close to the entry port of the mic body as possible. Turns out that mic cables, even though they are shielded, act like really big antennas. And at high RF frequencies, like cell phones and Wi-Fi, the wavelengths are short and we need to filter those right when they come into the mic body. Note the chassis ground connection to pin 1. The screw that mounts this to the frame electrically connects the rest of the mic body. Then we solder wire leads to pins 1, 2, and 3 of the XLR. Color code these to make the connections to the printed circuit board easier. We also need to glue our capsule to the saddle. There is a hole in the saddle that lets us feed the wires through. Glue the connection point of the capsule to the side with a hole. Set this aside and let the glue dry. I'm using E6000 glue and that needs a couple hours. Since the circuit board will be used for a microphone, we need to install the 1 gig ohm resistor for R11 and solder on the wires for the capsule. Make these about 4 to 5 inches long and then we will trim them down later. I use 24 or 26 gauge wire here. Once these are soldered to the board, do one final cleaning of the circuit board, focusing on the resistor and the input lead area. Cleanliness here is critical for proper operation. Now on to assembly. Feed the XLR connector through the bottom and screw the internal screw outward to lock it into place. Before mounting it to the frame, connect the three leads from the XLR to the printed circuit board at the points labeled pin 1, pin 2, and pin 3. Now mount the printed circuit board. You will want it on the side with a tab on the top of the frame facing you. Now we're going to mount the mic capsule and saddle. The first mic we're building uses the classic TSB2555B cardioid capsule. We're also going to use four little servo grommets to add some isolation and dampen internal vibrations of the microphone body. This isn't 100% critical, but it does make a difference in handling ability for the microphone. These press into the four slots on the saddle. The interesting thing with BM800 bodies and quality control, not all four holes are tapped. Most of them only have two that are, and that's okay for flush mounting and for the grommets. The ones with the screws will press down and hold the other grommets into place. If you look closely, you can see that this one only has two of those holes tapped. Before screwing it down, we need to feed the wires from the printed circuit board through. Now we can secure it with either two or four M2.5 screws. You did buy the assortment of them from Amazon, didn't you? Good. Now trim the leads and solder. If you get these backwards, the mic will work. It just won't be in phase with the rest of the microphones of the world. And yes, I have done this, which is how I know. All that's left now is to install the head basket and to screw the whole thing together. Figure 8 microphone. Remember when I said if you wire the capsule backwards it will still work? This is what gave me the idea that I could wire two capsules in series and combine them prior to the electronics. I did that with my MS build. Why would you want a figure 8 microphone to begin with? Well, they pick up sound in front of them and behind them in a pattern that kind of looks like a figure 8 on its side. But in use, it's really more about where they don't pick up sound than where they do pick up sound. Let's say you're outside in a park. And you want to record a really good singer-songwriter. You need a microphone for her voice and a separate one for her guitar. But if you use the standard cardioid mic on the guitar, you're going to pick up her voice, too. Then during mixdown, it's really hard to process them separately. But with a figure eight, you position the mic to put the null spot facing her voice as much as you can while still capturing the guitar. Then everyone's happy. They are used a lot when recording multiple musicians or instruments in a single performance. When you really need to isolate a quieter instrument from a louder one. They are not magic, but they really do help. My construction is the same as the first one we built, except we're using two TSB-165 capsules facing in opposite directions and wired in series, out of phase. This is how that looks on the schematic. And a shout out to my mic builder Tom who designed the saddles for these. See the instructable for full details on how to order everything to build this. Alright, now that we've got our microphones built, let's get out there and do some recording. It's right with you. 